Hey GearHeads and welcome to GT Garage Talk, a discussion about all things automotive. I am your host Corey and on this week's episode we are talking the best selling vehicle in the United States of America. That is the Ford F-Series pickup truck. They have a rich and storied history. They have seen the platform change drastically from a utilitarian tool to the family vehicle of Texas, as I deem the entire segment of full-size pickup trucks. They are literally everywhere here when I leave my house here in East Texas. So uh, this is not a conversation by myself. I have brought on a an authority on the subject, and that is author Jimmy Dinsmore. I've had him on this show before. We were talking about his previous book, Mustang by Design, and the history of the Ford Mustang. This week, we are talking about Ford F-Series trucks, his new book highlighting the history of the vehicle from 1948 until now. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Well, Jimmy, uh, great to have you back on the show. Great to see you in person in Chicago. I actually get to meet you, but uh, here we are virtually. How you doing? I'm, do I'm doing good, and it was really, really nice to like spend some time with you face-to-face -face in Chicago. That was Chicago as you know, is like my favorite auto show. Yep. And it, that one held up. It was really good. I got a lot out of it. Uh, and um, I, I had a great time meeting you and others and just spending some time on the show floor too. Yeah, I'm still a little hoarse from shouting out at you the entire time we were at that Nissan event. Uh, yeah, I'm catching was, my, that was loud. Yeah, my voice is coming back just a little <laughs> in, <laughs> in the time since. But, you know, that, last month's episode, we talked about, about the Chicago Auto Show and auto shows in general with the guys over or with David over at All Terrain Nation. And you and I have talked Detroit Auto Show. It it's just something that I hope never goes away. It it's changing, it's adapting, but I, I love a good auto show and getting to see the cars in person as I'm in this industry now for three plus years. It's great to meet people that I've only met online or catch up with people I've seen before and talked to before. It's kind of a, a homecoming of sorts, right? Yeah, I, I sure hope Detroit gets back to doing what they were the king of doing. And that was, you know, the best auto show in the world. Yeah. Because the, the one in September was, oof. Uh, I mean, I went to that, but that was, it was all kinds of lousy. Other than the Mustang, yeah. reveal there was like nothing there and the chicago auto show was exactly what you always wanted and needed to be it it did not disappoint and it's such a great consumer show yeah and there were so many great uh, product launches there the new toyota grand highlander the it seems like the war in three row suvs is on fire right now because grand highlander came out uh, Honda just reintroduced a new version of the Pilot. VW showed off the 2024 updated Atlas. And mm -hmm. it we've got Mazda coming out with the CX-90. Like, the battle is on for the three-row big crossover SUV segment. And I think it has to be because yeah. uh, before, they, it's like they, they tried to cram as many passengers in those you know, basically they're glorified crossovers and, and the, the third rows were a joke. Mm -hmm, like for, mm -hmm. for, you know, anyone who wasn't a child, like good luck even getting, getting back there and being comfortable. I mean, you know, previously I pra praised how much I love minivans and mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the interior space was so good and these SUVs didn't have that. Well, like you said, now they're catching up to that for S sure. Still not quite there. The minivan has still got it beat, I think, in overall packaging because again the minivan is more function over form whereas suv is more form over function and yeah. you and i agree wholeheartedly hashtag save the minivan <laughs> but uh it's it's an interesting look going forward i i will preview a little something something i will be heading back to chicago this summer celebrating 100 years of route 66 we did the first half of Route 66, California to Texas, in a Chrysler Pacifica, and Chrysler was nice enough to help us finish the trip this summer, celebrating the 
100th anniversary with Texas to Chicago in a Chrysler Pacifica. So oh, that's cool because I, I've been on Route 66, like in the Illinois part, but mm-hmm. I've never been beyond that. So um, I. I was less impressed with the Illinois portion of it. So you probably <laughs> saw the best of Route 66 already. Yeah, we are still in the planning stages of uh, what we want to see in between here and Chicago. I know what I want to see in Chicago. I've never had a vehicle at my disposal while there in the summer. Like, I've been in there in the summer. I've been there with a vehicle at, at my disposal. Never at the same time. So mm-hmm. a baseball game is definitely on the list. Got two nice. teams to choose from. Uh, so there's no, there's you gonna... don't. You got to go to the Cubs. Forget the White Sox. <laughs> As a lifelong Astros fan who suffered through the what was that 05 World Series where we got swept by the White Sox, yes, I, I would very much like to go see the Cubs before seeing those dirty, rotten scoundrels, the White Sox. I yeah, just never. Exactly. <laughs> Plus, it's Wrigley Field. I mean, it's yeah. historic. So. Yeah. If I could get both while I'm there, you know, I, I've got to go. Got to get all 30 stadiums because, you know, I haven't even been to the new Rangers stadium. That shows you just how busy I've been wow. since they've opened it. But I grew up going to the Astrodome, no longer there or in use. Uh, and then in Arlington, went to Arlington Stadium. It's been through many different names. They're no longer using that. So I've got two defunct stadiums on my list. I've got to start adding to current stadiums on my list it's far too short of a list of ones that i've been to but we'll, yeah we'll rectify that for sure but again you're here to talk about ford f-150 there's been a lot going on with f-150 kind of in the news sort of as of late chevy's starting to claim something that ford's been claiming for a long time so uh, very interesting to get your take on all of this. But first, why don't you preview a little bit? I know we talked about it last time you were on, but you've got a book highlighting the history of the F-150, don't you? I sure do. It's called uh, Ford F-Series Trucks, 1948 to present. And when we say present, we mean present. Thanks to the pandemic, because I wrote mm-hmm. this book long before, four years ago, actually. Yeah. So pre-pandemic, this book was quote unquote unquote, done and then the pandemic hit and it got shelved and i didn't think it was ever going to actually make it to print so they said hey after the pandemic they're like we want to do it but we want to can you can you modify it a little bit which that gave me time to get the 14th generation Mm -hmm. f-150 information in including maverick including uh f-150 lightning so everything always works out for a reason and uh, I'm very happy to to have this book. I think it, it's kind of the ultimate guide to uh, what I call America's best-selling vehicle, which is mm-hmm. one of the things you were alluding to mm-hmm. between the showdown between Chevy and Ford. Uh, Ford kind of hides their numbers a little bit. They don't separate the F-250, F-350, right. the Super Duties. And they just throw all their – anything that's an F-Series is lumped into one big sale, which is an impressive sale. I think mm-hmm. uh, it accounts – 48 billion with a B, 48 billion dollars <laughs> on their uh, bottom line in sales. So, if you don't think that everything at it, Dearborn runs through, you know, the Ford F Series, then you're fooling yourself. It's all it. Everything else uh, doesn't matter when when you take into that number. Yeah, and you know that I've seen so many conversations about cab length and bed length and this, that, and the other, and everybody wants a regular cab, standard or long bed. And just like, you know, I'm a big fan of manual transmission vehicles. You and I are both fans of minivans. If they're not selling, it they won't make it. It won't be there. There has to be a business case for these companies to back it up and go through all the expense of making the product. So very. Yeah. And, and while some legislators sit and say, you know, in California, they may say, I don't, why do we need trucks? I never see trucks. Well, you may not see that many trucks in LA, but down there in Texas Mm. where you are, you throw a rock and you hit a truck. And even here in Ohio, I mean, every other vehicle on the road is, is some kind of truck. So you're fooling yourself if you think otherwise. I mean, the truck is still a juggernaut of a vehicle, not just for Ford, but for every automaker. Yeah. When they really started rolling out with the crew cab, 
as not an afterthought, but a f- first thought when designing vehicles. I think what late 90s, early 2000s is when the brands, all of the brands really started leaning in and saying, you know what, crew cab's a way to go. That became the de facto family vehicle of Texas. And I, you and I were talking before I hit record. I did a road trip video this weekend with a friend. Uh, his channel is about Texas and road tripping Texas and seeing all of it. And while we were talking, we were uh, doing an interview for his podcast and we were talking about full size trucks being everywhere. And I was like, yep, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. And I was not joking. They literally were just everywhere around us because it's the family vehicle here in Texas. And anytime I post a video where I talk about that, on my channel everybody was like if you don't need a truck don't get a truck i'm like trust me people are over trucked it is i mean people use trucks as daily drivers do they need to no but i'm also a capitalist if you want to if you can afford a truck and you want a truck and you're you're never even going to tow or pull anything but you like the look of them you like the stature whatever i say spend your money how you want and, and enjoy what you want and likewise all automakers are foolish if they don't pay attention to those mm. things. And make no mistake, they're paying attention to those yeah. things. So have you gotten wheel time? I know you review cars as well. How much wheel time have you gotten in the latest generation of F- F-Series pickup truck? So I have been in uh, the hybrid. Mm-hmm. I have been in the, what is it, the 3.5? Mm-hmm. Um, I've been in that one and... Um, I have been a little bit in the lightning, but in May I get the lightning for a whole week. So that'll be, I'm really looking forward to that. Cause I want to see what kind of range you're really going to pull on that. I mean, I'm not going to tow on it or right. anything, but like, I, I really, really like the time I've spent in the lightning. I see its merit. I'm not mm-hmm. saying it's going to overtake any, any portion of the, of the gasoline or diesel, uh, segment, but I, I think it, it, it's a niche and it, you know, it has, it has a purpose and, and a role. Yeah. I, we had one for a week. Uh, it, it, I felt like it rained the entire time we had it, except no, it, for the day that I filmed going to get groceries, which, uh, we put that video up just a short, uh, reel. And that's probably my most watched content on the internet no, right now is loading the gro- groceries in the frunk because, very controversial that there's no engine under the hood of that F-150. But again, going back to full-size pickups being the family vehicle of Texas, I did the math while we had that one. It was cheaper per mile charging it at home to drive that than my very economical, compact, manual transmission, four-cylinder turbo car. Like... Mm. If you wanted a vehicle with space where everyone is comfortable and could spread out, yes, I know the purchase price of that truck has now crept into six figures, as ours was specced because we had a platinum version. But, you know, if you are in the market for a new vehicle, don't write EVs off, but definitely do your research because, yeah, there's there's a lot. It's a different world. It's a different it's a lifestyle and uh, you have to be ready for that aspect of it. I'm sure I'm very anxious to see what you think of it after living with it for a week. No, I I'm, I'm super excited for it. Um, And it kind of, that all is kind of a good segue about like what I think the overall theme of my Ford truck book is. And that's like the evolution of Mm. society the truck has been there right by the side of American society. Like it started as basically the model TT, like a big, you know, four wheels and in a frame basically. Yeah. And then it became this, like you said, the 14th generation is like a family vehicle. That's a freaking pickup truck, you know, and now it's an electrified version. So, but if you look back, society has gone this way like we have gone from a very agricultural Mm -hmm. rural setting uh in you know post post post-world war ii 
to you know this age of electronics and technology that we all live in now and lo and behold right there's the f series alongside of us so it's it's kind of like a, a good what a what's the phrase a bell cow type of vehicle mm-hmm. like the so. first ford f series vehicle in my life was uh one that it was a hand me down from uh my grandparents to my dad uh, i was gosh I was around 10 years old when when we had it in my most memorable time frame, but I believe it was an 83 F100. And Mm -hmm. I do remember it was a blue and white paint job. It was the Explorer package before they used Explorer on the SUV. And it had a camper shell on the back, but the white paint on it was... It needed wax because it was chalky and yeah. like you would get it all over your hands. But man, I think that was the last year they used the F one hundred name too. I think probably right around that time frame. Yeah, and I remember my dad used it for a while as a territory car covering East Texas for IBM doing repairs on machines all <laughs> over the East Texas area. And I remember he he would talk about it had dual fuel tanks. And having to swap over fuel tanks and stuff like that. Just talking about the evolution of vehicles, just my faint memories of that old F100. It was a regular cab with the push button. Uh, You had to use your thumb to even open the doors. Granted, Mm -hmm. my first car was a 91 Cadillac, and it had similar door handles. That's more of a sign of the times. But uh, just very utilitarian vehicle the ride was not great I, I don't know how my dad put so many miles on it using it for a uh, territory truck it moved with us from the houston area up here to east texas like it we put it to work but uh yeah very very different vehicle in what you get now my most recent experience being a 22 f-150 lightning platinum and man if you would have slapped a Lincoln badge on that vehicle, I would have believed you. Yep, absolutely. I mean that again. That's society has gone this way, and then from a, a consumer, you know, a, a market standpoint, you're the automaker. Like, who can afford that kind of vehicle? People say, well, they're selling like hotcakes. So mm-hmm. obviously, maybe you and I can't afford them, but. Right plenty of people can afford them because otherwise they wouldn't sell them at that price. Right. Shoot. I'm pricing some other like smaller vehicles and I'm like, I can't afford that right now. <laughs> like, exactly. I just, exactly. Uh, not to get into a tangent about inflation and all that, but I, I've just, I'm, I'm getting crotchety in my old age and I'm like, cars ain't what they <laughs> used to be. <laughs> and I've but been... in a way they're so much better, but mm-hmm. it comes at a price too. I mean, you were talking about your first vehicle. So the first vehicle I bought with my own money was an 88 uh, Ford. I think it was a technically an F-250. So mm-hmm. I had to like get up into it and mm-hmm. everything. Real, I mean, it's brown. I mean, remember the old brown exterior paint? Mm-hmm. That, it was brown with tan trim. So like it was brown and tan. Real ugly. But like as I was lo- looking through the book, I found a photo that really looked like the same one that I had. I'm like, oh, this is this is almost like my first truck, except mine had some rust and only bought it for two thousand dollars. Yeah. But of course, I I pull out the stereo and I put in a Pioneer stereo because you know in '88, you know, right. well actually this would have been '92. So in '92, you know, Pioneer stereos were where it was at. So I, you know, I put speakers and everything. And I mean, I thought it was hot stuff driving around a truck. It didn't last very long. It had a lot of miles on it. Yeah. So. Hey, and that's another thing that pickup trucks tend to do is all brands, all manufacturers, I've seen Toyota, I've seen Chevy, GMC, and Ford all claim when their consumers get million mile trucks or more. And it's just really cool to see that kind of loyalty, that kind of longevity. And especially down here in Texas, people take truck brand loyalty seriously and you could almost start a war showing up in the wrong thing at the wrong place (laughs) i mean just being on some of these forums as i Mm -hmm. talk about my book and stuff like yeah you get you get some some guy in who's a big 
Chevy guy and steps into the Ford for him, it's like he's going to get banned or, you know, something's going to happen. It, it gets it gets crazy. I guess because, you know, you and I are review cars and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not a brand loyalist. Mm-hmm. Even as a consumer, I'm not. Like, I, I want – I'm going to consider multiple different brands and vehicles for whatever reasons. Right. But – I, I'm a guy who can respect loyalty, but like, I just don't understand like the crazy passion behind all that. You know, we were talking sports earlier. It's just something wired in our caveman brains. We, we've got to latch on to something. And I, I joked when I was at my corporate job, like what if people took mundane office jobs as seriously as they take sports or anything else in the world? And I wanted to do, this was back when Vine was a thing, so who knows? Maybe I can make a TikTok series on it. But uh, if there were press conferences after a day at work in a cubicle, like <laughs> what? Just that's essentially what we're doing. People make cars for us to live with, yet we, in our caveman brains, put so much behind this. I mean, true. we've talked about Ch- tactics that can bring that stuff to this meeting. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. And, and we've talked about using the Mustang <laughs> name on the Mach E and how much controversy mm. that caused. When in reality, like to quote Shakespeare, a rose by any other name, like it, it's yeah. still a good vehicle. I enjoyed my time in it. It it definitely made me re-examine what I thought of the Ford brand, because that was the first Ford press vehicle I ever received. I don't know how I managed that one, (laughs) but perhaps one of the most revolutionary new Ford vehicles was the first ever uh, press vehicle, but definitely made me relook at the brand as a, and I'll claim it as a lifelong Chevy guy. Like Mm -hmm. that's just who I am. I, I gravitate towards them, but Having done this, having been in the F-150 Lightning, and we were in the uh, Power Boost King Ranch, which we road tripped that one. Oh, my goodness. That thing was so comfortable oh, yeah. with the massaging seats. The- yeah. I mean, you, Ram is like, I mean, to be honest, they can hang right there. I mean, let's be honest. So can Sierra. and I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, Tundra. I mean, you're down there in Texas. You probably see a lot of Tundra and stuff. So, I mean... I don't know. Like today's trucks are not at all what they were in no, 1948 they... when when the F series started. That's for sure. And I... that's why, like, in the book, I talked to a guy named House Berlick, who, if you recall, when we talked about my other book, Mustang by Design, mm-hmm. he was actually the organ the the, uh, the product planner for the original Ford Mustang. He worked at Ford forever, and after he got fired uh, at Ford, he went to uh, Chrysler. And worked on pickup trucks, including um, the 1994 Ram, which is a you know a legendary mm-hmm. truck. So I got hit a lot of feedback from House Berlick on you know what truck where trucks fit in the whole scheme of things. And honestly, from the beginning, it was a throwaway vehicle. It was just like nothing but a farmer would drive. Mm-hmm. There wasn't any money in it. There wasn't any profit in it. And you know, he used the term civilization of the truck. It really got, as society got a little more civilized, the truck got more civilized, and therefore money got put into it. And as money got put into it, all of a sudden executives are paying attention. And then he said it wasn't until, like, the 80s when you even see, like, the the executives using, you know, a, a pickup truck as, like, their vehicle that they're driving and he said at that point that's when everybody's like started paying attention because before that like at ford they they drive a lincoln or a mustang mm-hmm. or you know who knows what but it would never have been a pickup truck until you know late 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 into the into the 80s and 90s so yeah you bring up the 94 ram i still remember the ad campaigns for those rams and i had a friend whose first vehicle was that generation ram there was just something so magical about it it had big rig looks and an attitude about it that modern ones don't really capture 
in the same way. And, you know, it, it's fun to take a look back and see, yes, the civilization of the pickup truck and how far they've come and what we demand of them now. Because it's got to do it all. It, it has to be the family vehicle. It has to be the workhorse. It has to do this and it has to do that. And it, trying to, I, I don't envy product planners at all having this long list of things that their product has to do. And it's like, all right, where do we make the compromises? Because we we're talking earlier, cab lengths have grown, bed lengths have shrunk. And people are going, but but wait, I, I want my long bed or I don't need these back doors. And, you know, Chevy just recently with their midsize pickup truck said crew cab only. So mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of waiting for the day full size pickups say crew cab only. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see I, if it yeah, ever gets I don't there. know. I think they're going to leave money on the table if they do. I mean, obviously crew cab is what the, the majority of people want. But – you know, you talk about like well, truck beds or you know bed lengths and everything. If you think about it, in um, in the book, I also talked to um, Gail Halderman, who was the original designer of the Ford Mustang, but he also worked in the Ford Truck Studio, and he told me like designing trucks was the hardest thing because he said it's just a rectangular box. Mm -hmm. You couldn't you couldn't change angles. You couldn't tweak anything. Like you could maybe modify a headlight. Or, you know, touch up the grill. But if you think about it, like, revolutionary, you, the truck's been the same shape from the beginning, from 1948. The F-Series the F has looked like, you know, a truck. Yeah. <laughs> and and God else. forbid, if anybody tried to come in and change it, they'd say, well, that's not a truck now. Like, our, our, our eyes know what a truck is and they recognize it and you can't, you can't modify it that much. Yeah. And heaven forbid, if you're, you know, uh, today's designer and you, you try to go crazy. And I mean, what was that? The, uh, the, the Chevy 2500 where they had that, it, it looked like a giant robot grill or something. And they mm -hmm. just got destroyed for how horrible and hideous it looked. And I'm like, you know what? Like, did I like it? No, but I at least said, you know what? They tried yeah. to do something. A lot of people didn't like the new Tundra because they said that girl had like a, it looked like a Fu Manchu, <laughs> like mustache yeah. and everything. I'm yeah. like, again, people, they're trying. There's not that much they can do. Mm -hmm. If they didn't do enough, you would have said, oh, it looks the same. It's boring. So well, 21 you know, damned if you do and damned if you don't. Yeah, the 21 F-150 redesign, it was more or less a, a freshening yeah, it was very underwhelming. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm i in the industry. I know. And sometimes I had to do a double take. I'm like, is that the new one or is that the old one? Right. And right. to your point, yeah, there's only so much you can do. So, yeah, Toyota swung big with the Tundra and love it or hate it. It, it is what it is. And uh, Chevy has already gone back and fixed the 2500 and uh, yeah. have updated it for 2024. So, you know, they're they're trying, they're experimenting, they're seeing what works, what doesn't. They're, you know, they're trying to, their ear is to the ground as well. They know that, oh, it looks like this or, oh, it looks like that. And people are always going to say that about every car. But, yes, there's well, only so much. Especially, like you said, there's so much passion about trucks. And I remember um, Hal Spurlick said on that 94 Ram, uh, which was like the, one of the last vehicles he worked on before he retired. I mean, he said they literally told the designers and everybody on the project, like, whatever you were planning, throw it away. We're, we're changing everything on this. And Ford was behind. They did it intentionally because Ford had, had, was outpacing him at a good good scale. Mm -hmm. Then the Ram comes out with, with it in 94, which is right in the middle of the ninth generation F series. And Ford basically was like, Oh hell. Like, <laughs> Oh no. Like, cause they saw, well, now we've got to get going much quicker. So they, they hurried up and got the 10th generation out there as a result of what Ram did in 94. So mm -hmm. I love competition like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the rivalries with Ford and Ram and Ford and Chevy, like, you know who wins from that? The consumer wins yeah. because they're all paying attention. They all want your dollar and 
you know, may, may the best automaker win is what I always say. Absolutely. Absolutely. What other fun anecdotes might you uh, hint at being in the book or maybe got left on the editing room table? Well, so I have a, because, you know, I'm kind of like enthralled with like design aspect mm -hmm. of the industry and everything. Um, I have a lot of really cool uh, sketches of trucks yeah. that never made it to production, but uh, I touched, I, I reached out to several um, uh, designers that I knew and they, they submitted a lot of their sketches for trucks and whoo boy, some of these are like really pie in the sky kind of looks, but one of them looks almost like maybe Elon Musk saw this way, <laughs> way back when. Oh my. And got inspired for the Cybertruck because it looked a lot like the Cybertruck. Okay. So, and this was a sketch. Let me see. I have to look close. From 1971, I wow. look. I, I looked what he, he had uh, in the in the bottom right hand corner of his sketch. It, it's got a cyber truck look to it. Interesting. And as much as I still don't like the cyber truck, I'm like, yeah, I can see why Ford said no on this design. <laughs> yeah, so. we'll pass. <laughs> Interesting. Very. Yeah. Again, there's only so much you can do, and when you deviate from that whatsoever, the market lets you know. And, you know, we can talk all day long, but ultimately we vote with our dollars and F-Series has been the best-selling vehicle in America for how long now? 40 plus years running? Yep. So I would think Ford kind of has it figured out just a little bit. And Absolutely. They know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on officially from Chevy? I'm actually going to go to their website because there are so many asterisks, asterisks, I can't even say yeah. it, <laughs> um, in their uh, statement on the new Silverado. It is the number one best-selling retail full-size heavy-duty pickup is the HD, so there's that. And then the number one best-selling retail full-size light-duty pickup and both of those have an asterisk on them. And when I reached out to my Chevy content contact, I was like, so you outsold F-150? Because that's huge if you did. And he said, yes. But when you read that asterisk, it says, based on S&P Global Mobility 2022 calendar year ending. Uh, and it's based on U.S. new vehicle registrations using GM custom retail registration type in the half ton and large pickup segments. So, hmm. again, the fact that they were even to ask, able to asterisk it out <laughs> into mm -hmm. a marketable statement that has some validity of truth speaks not only to what Chevy is doing, but you've been bringing them up what Dodge and now Ram has been doing because Chevy doesn't eat away at Ford's lunch all by themselves. They've had help. And I, I think <clears throat> Ram is absolutely the unsung hero of this story for Chevrolet stealing market share less from Chevy and more from Ford. So some really big brand switching going on there. I mean, I, if you're looking for an argument, you're not going to get one. I mean, okay. for sure. Uh, I mean, it's always been Ford versus Chevy, but like you said, Ram has been a steady Eddie and for a while they lost their way. And then, Oh boy, are those new Ram trucks like unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I know like, you know, I love the the Raptor. Like I have touted how much like the 2017 Ford Raptor is one of my all time favorite vehicles. Okay. But then I got to spend some time in the TRX and I was like, <laughs> hold on now. Like <laughs> what? Like the Ram TRX was and is an unbelievable vehicle mm -hmm. to where I'm like, okay, I see what you're doing here. I, let's raise the bar. I'm, I'm always one. The worst thing any automaker can do is just sit back on their laurels and say, well, we're still selling vehicles because guess what? The competition is going to get to you and pass you. We've seen it well, from Hyundai and Kia when Toyota and Honda were just raking in sales on their sedans and they didn't do anything to the Camry or the Accord for all those years. Still sold a lot. And then all of a sudden, Hyundai and Kia shake off the... Uh, 
the 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 misnomer that some people had that they were just junky cars right. that didn't last. Well, then they throw a ten year warranty at it, and the bar gets raised. And guess what? Oh my! Well, Hyundai and Kia are just as good as Toyota and, and Honda now. So then Toyota and Honda had to get off their laurels and get going again. So if Ford gets complacent in the F in the F one fifty F series world. I mean, the competition's going to knock them out. Yeah, and and it's not a bad thing. It's yeah. not a bad thing. That that has to be the most competitive in, in the back end of things, just because those brands are really vying for those dollars. That's you referenced it earlier. Dearborn is built on the F one fifty now, or the F series now, and the big three auto American automakers are making their money here in this segment, this full-size pickup truck segment, and everything else is because of the money that oh, they've been able to bring in sure. here. I think I saw, and I, I'm, I don't remember the actual source, but like when uh, like Ford was making still sedans like the Taurus or something, mm -hmm. roughly they were making about $1,000 off of a sedan, and they were making $10,000 off of, SUVs and fifteen thousand dollars off trucks. Yeah. So if you're the C the CFO and CEO, what are you gonna put all your focus and attention on? <laughs> yep. And then all of a sudden you're like, you know what? We're not gonna make that sedan anymore, and I'm gonna make four more new new variants of a pickup truck. Oh, and maybe we'll do one in electric and oh, hey, how about we launch a new view uh, a new small truck and see what what's out there for those people. So then they launched the Maverick, which is in my opinion, tremendous. Like it, it's a game changer in a, a segment that was always hiding there uh, behind consumers mm -hmm. uh, who couldn't afford big trucks and didn't really need like all that towing, but still wanted a truck probably as a daily driver. Yeah. And lo and behold, they found a segment that was there in the eighties and nineties and then got ignored and passed by. <laughs> so now it's back. So have you had any wheel time in a Maverick? I actually have had tremendous wheel time in, in the hybrid and the non-hybrid and also in uh, the Santa Fe as well. Okay. Um, so is that the, yeah, the Santa yeah. Fe, that's the truck. Yeah. No, Santa Cruz, in, Santa Fe. I'm is, sorry, the Santa Cruz. Yeah. See, that's the problem with Hyundai. I get all their names. So <gasps> yeah. yes, in the Santa Cruz, I've, yes. I've gotten time in those. And so I, if I were going to buy my own vehicle now, mm -hmm. it would be probably the maverick because okay. i like it that much i like having a truck i like the idea the look of them uh i would get i would get the hybrid for sure mm -hmm. uh, i liked the maverick that much yeah we had one very early on in the product life cycle like i don't think i had seen one on the road yet when that one showed up for from ford and it was a head scratcher to me because it's not how I would have spec'd it. And going on build and price, I'm like, well, I probably would have done this and that and this and that. And, you know, we had the, uh, gosh, I can't even remember all the specs on it. We had a pretty high, highly spec'd out version of it, but it felt like it was missing a few things that I could step down a level and tweak the option package a little bit and be a little more satisfied with what I got out of it. But now they've got the trimmer version, which really has got my interest peaked. That's what I just had a couple weeks ago was the tremor version. And that was like, whoa, okay, now I yeah. feel you. So I know that there's one in the fleet that I have access to. I am waiting patiently for it to show up because... I will be taking it to my standard off-road test grounds, and I, I, I would. I didn't get to take it off-roading, but um, I did have it uh, when we had some snow on the ground, mm -hmm. and it, it was very, very confident. So, yeah, I, I, the one vehicle that I don't understand now is like the Ranger is kind of like lost in the fray mm -hmm. of everything mm -hmm. because if you remember, like in the early '90s, the Ranger was basically the size of the Maverick, like mm -hmm. it was a small truck. And people liked it for that reason. And then all of a sudden, nobody's making small trucks except for Toyota. And then trucks get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now the Ranger, I mean, I haven't done a side-by-side, -side, but I guarantee if you put a, a, a new Ranger versus like uh, a mid-90s, you know, F-150, they're the same exact size. 
I like 100 percent agree. I, to me, I just don't. I, I guess it's it's a, a price point, perhaps, but I just don't understand the uh, the point of the Ranger at this point in Forge lineup. Yep. So while we had our Ranger, we parked it next to the last generation before. Uh, sorry, when we had the Maverick, we parked it next to a Ranger that was the last gen before its rebirth as a, was it from Ford Europe that they brought it over? Or mm-hmm. yeah, Yes. And um, yes, they were practically the same size. And uh, we had a Ranger before the Maverick, I do believe. I liked it fine, uh, but it was almost big enough that... We never parked it in our garage, so, you know, it's definitely climbing up in size, but the back seat was still very cramped, so Mm -hmm. you really wouldn't like it compared to a full-size truck. And then going back to Chevy's, like, I had an 07 Silverado, and I was recently in a 23, and even in that amount of time, I'm like, wow, these trucks have gotten that much bigger, granted they delivered me a trail boss, which has a two inch lift on it. So I was sitting higher than everybody on the road. I felt like, but Mm -hmm. yeah, even since I last owned a full size pickup truck, they've grown massively. And I don't know, it it is, it is almost getting insane, but I think the, uh, maybe the thing keeping them at their current size is the regulation for all the marker lamps if you get over what is it 80 inches wide mm-hmm. and if we as consumers are like oh i like that so much i mean they put it on the tundra trd pro if that's just standard on all trucks now because they're just that massive everybody's gonna be like oh i've got a big truck so i don't know oh yeah <laughs> it's just a, a status symbol at that point I yeah think, so uh, <laughs> And again, if that's what you want, knock yeah. yourself out. I'm not here to, to poo poo any of that. Like it, it's, you know, there's there's a market out there for that. Yeah, yeah. So, Maverick is where you would go in the Ford lineup. Uh, Maverick hybrid, with what trim maybe? Mm, probably just the Lariat. I mean, I yeah. I don't need like, you know, even their base trims. They have plenty of stuff now. Yeah. Like, I'd really like to sample, uh, again, this was before the trimmer came out, the FX4 that I saw at many a car show after having hours. I was like, I think that's that's probably the sweet spot for me. Everything just I seems, like that trim a lot, too. Yeah, just right. Like, it's got the right look, wheels, tires, and all that. So, trimmer just sweetens the pot all that much more. So, hopefully I get some time behind the wheel of that one and uh, we can refamiliarize ourselves with that pickup truck. The the only thing as a family vehicle that I, I'm almost like this is unforgivable Ford, fix it as soon as possible. I've got a four-year-old. He's about to be five. He's still in a fixed in place child safety seat. One, mm-hmm. installing that wasn't any fun. And two, when it was installed, the back seat is a solid bench instead of being oh. 60 40 split. So uh, you're locking yourself out of underfloor storage by putting a child seat in the back. And as I mentioned, they aren't fun to get in and out. So once it's in, right. it's in. So if they could figure out, I know part of the mission of the Maverick is to be affordable. But if they could figure out a way to make that a 60 40 split bench seat, that is going to open up just an entirely different avenue of uh, people that could legitimately look at that without any hesitation or reservation. Interesting. Cause I, w- I don't think of the Maverick as a family vehicle. So I think of it as uh, like, if you're, you want a, a daily driver or a commuter uh, or maybe just a little weekend warrior where you got to, you know, move some mulch or something like that. Um, or like retirees. I don't know. I just, I don't think of it. I, if I had, if I was in your situation, I wouldn't be considering the Maverick at all in that regard. So, well, you know, uh, one of the two cars in the driveway right now are, are, uh, a compact car. So it would be an easy transition. Uh, if we wanted to just completely change type and not necessarily upgrade in size, but Mm -hmm. again, doing what you and I do with new vehicles coming in and out all the time, 
I, I can't tell you the next time I'm actually going to spend money on a vehicle that isn't like a long-term tester for the channel. I Knock on wood, I, I hope it's a long time before I actually had to do that. Uh, just given the nature That's of... That's same for me. I mean, I get 60 plus vehicles a year. I have no need for my yeah. own... But uh, we, we keep two around. Luckily, I just got sponsored by carcover.com and uh, Chevy Cruze is parked outside. And I did look under the cover today. She's still all shiny, black, and pretty, not covered in all the yellow pollen that is invading uh, all of East, East Texas. Yes. <clears throat> if, if you can't tell by my voice, it's not just uh, from our time at that Nissan event. Yeah. It, oof. The uh, Death Star of the Pollen Spore is definitely uh. here in East Texas in full force. But, all right, Jimmy, we'll, we'll wrap this one up before we yep. just go crazy into 20 different tangents. Sure. E easiest way to find your book is on your Amazon store, correct? Yes, uh, both uh, the Ford Truck book and uh, the previous book, Mustang by Design, both up there. Uh, you can search my name. Everything comes up, uh, the two books come up. So, Yes, and I I'm trying to make it as easy as possible as well. You can go to gtgaragetalk.com slash gear, and I've got uh, both of your books right there with links to them both and links to both of our episodes um, where we discuss uh, the Detroit Auto Show and Mustangs, and now uh, we'll have this one up on that site as well. So, uh, multiple different ways to find you, your work, and what you do. And, uh, yeah, very excited to have you on and talk Ford pickup trucks. I, I appreciate you having me on, as always. And it was it was honestly one of the highlights of my time in Chicago was, was getting to hang with you finally face-to-face. -face, so. Well, I appreciate it, too. Like, I, I, this was the first show where I really felt like I could walk around and almost say hi to anybody and everybody. And it, it really was, aside from the loud music at that Nissan event, a, a highlight of the trip for me. Getting to sit down with you, the guys from um, All Terrain Nation, and uh, Tim Estradal sat with us for a little yeah. while. And just getting to catch up with and, and, and chat with everybody that I've met over my short career here in the automotive industry. But... Uh, yes, thank you very much. Looking forward to staying in touch with you and seeing what's next from you. Yeah, I got some good things cooking, so we'll see. All right, all right. Thank you. And I thank Jimmy once again for coming on this week and talking to me about the F-150, the F-Series pickup truck uh, over its lifespan. You know, he, he kind of snuck the Maverick in there, but you can't talk ford pickup trucks without talking maverick as of late that thing has exploded in popularity to the point that when ford opens the order books they're open for like an hour and then they max out capacity and they're basically printing money with those vehicles <laughs> they need to find a way to ramp up output of those vehicles because the demand is apparently still unmet on the ford maverick so Yes, absolutely an interesting vehicle. Very much of an appeal to him. Again, we had one. We enjoyed our time with it. We put it to work. We moved a uh, workbench from a grandparent's house uh, to my house. Uh, first thing we did to it was we took it to Ikea, but uh, barely put it to work there. All kinds of fun stuff. We've had the Ranger here. We've had the F-150. A lot of good stuff going on over at Ford. I am, as a lifelong Chevy guy, very interested in the fact that Chevy is now touting that they are the best-selling retail vehicle. I think that's the key word in all of it because, you know, Ford does great on their fleet sales as well. I used to work for a chain of grocery stores that I believe most of, if not all, of the fleet uh, pickup trucks for uh, doing work, maintenance work and stuff are F-Series pickup trucks. So there's a market there that needs to be addressed, but yes. Um, and I, I still maintain that uh, Chevy has Ram to thank for that. So a lot of fun stuff going on. He, Jimmy and I are both big proponents of competition, and I'm just loving what we are seeing uh, as um, the 
competition ramps up in this very heated, hot segment of the market. So thanks again to Jimmy for coming on. You can go to amazon.com slash author slash Jimmy Dinsmore, or you can go to gtgaragetalk.com slash gear. And I've got all of the books that have been featured on this podcast right up top. I've got other gear that you can buy on Amazon that we've tested, that we've recommended, including EV chargers, home chargers, uh, even stuff that I use on both my podcast here and on the YouTube channel. So just all kinds of fun stuff. And you help the channel out in the process. Just even if you don't buy any of those items, go to gtgaragetalk.com slash gear Click on one of those links before you buy something else. That that helps out too. Gotta love Amazon. But that is it for this month on the podcast. I gotta get used to recording these monthly. As always, you can find us on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, everything at GT Garage Talk or GTGaragetalk.com. Until next time, gearheads. Bye.